welcome back to the Colorblind Architect Podcast. I'm David, and you know what? The lighting's going to really suck this morning. That's right. It is December, the sun is low in the sky, and it is shining in all kinds of weird angles as it comes into the car. So as we're driving, just understand, there's going to be some really crappy lighting today. So, here's the thing been talking a lot about politics in most of my episodes and some of you if you aren't familiar with me you might be wondering then why the heck are you calling yourself the colorblind architect well because yes I am actually an architect and so here's the thing I recently had one of my projects on the agenda for a planning commission at a local city this project Um, shouldn't have been all that contentious, to be quite honest. We were asking the Planning Commission for us, for a small exception to the rule. Um, it had to do with an architectural design aspect that the zoning ordinance, while it could be interpreted the way that we interpreted it, the Planning Commission, as a staff, they were interpreting it another way. To be specific, it was a facade length. The zoning was saying you can't have a facade longer than 200 feet. Okay, well that makes sense because you know in cities you want to break things up so that it's not so boring, you know, right? You don't want just 300 feet of blank wall, right? You want to have a very interesting streetscape so that people can enjoy walking along the street because I mean this is after all in a city, not in the country. So, totally understandable rule. However, the Planning Commission was interpreting that as being the end of the building, not the facade. So, we had to go to the Planning Commission and say, hey, um, we want to have this longer. Now, so everything else about the project, everything, I mean, like everything, we could build by right based on the fact that we you know, complied with all the zoning ordinances, and we even scored really high on what the what that city has as a um, particular scorecard to allow you to have development bonuses, density bonuses, um, parking reduction, and stuff like that. So, you know, a typical a typical big big city type stuff where you know they're trying to encourage more density so that it makes it easier for uh, developers to build apartments at a density that supports lower prices in the market because that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in big cities is affordable housing. So here we go. We're, We're in the planning commission and this is actually the second time we're in the planning commission meeting and a lot of the neighborhood shows up in droves and of course they're shouting not in my backyard type stuff you know they're you know they're complaining about the parking at least most people were complaining about the parking and I'm gonna get to that Um, that's that's a that's an issue that's always an issue people are always concerned about having adequate parking because what they don't want is for a new apartment to come in and then you have a bunch of people parking throughout the streets now you might be wondering at this point, Dave, oh my goodness, get back to uh, politics. This is boring as heck. Okay, well, okay, maybe, maybe. It's interesting to me, so I'm going to talk about it. So, here is the interesting part. We had a division or uh, wing or chapter, I'm not sure what you call it, of Antifa. Um show up to our um, planning commission meeting to try to speak out against us and it was really interesting now they don't call themselves Antifa in Salt Lake City we they actually refer to themselves as the Brown Berets I'm not quite sure why but you know for whatever reason they call themselves the Brown Berets Um, anyways which is also kind of strange, the whole beret thing, because that makes it sound like a bunch of communists, which they might be, I'm not sure. Anyways, 
not to speak ill of them. However, their big issue was gentrification. Yes, that's right. They were bringing up the issue of gentrification concerning our apartment project. Okay, so here we are, we have an apartment building that has the density that allows us to rent out the apartments at 70% the average market index price for our area. So in other words, we're already on the more affordable side. By the way, just for reference, federal, federal uh, subsidized housing is at about 65%. Okay, so we're pretty close at a market rate. That's right, renting it at market with no subsidies for almost as cheap as what housing projects that are subsidized by the government. So in other words, we're actually doing what capitalism is supposed to be doing for providing affordable housing. However, these, these uh, brown block people, or brown berets, they're fighting against us because, oh, we're gentrifying the neighborhood. Now, never mind you, the houses that we were, were replacing with this apartment building, get this, five of the seven houses have been vacant for years because they've been used as meth houses and it's too expensive to clean up the meth so that they can be rented again. The other two have a menagerie of people living in them that are not related, they're not families, and they are most likely doing drugs. And we're being told by these brown, block, brown berets that, oh, well, these are families that are living there. And it's like, well, we, we know who lives there because we own those houses. I mean, as a development company, we do. So, here's, here's the thing. What do you do when you have people who won't even listen to you? I mean, like, so let's get back to the parking thing first. Okay, so a lot of the comments from the parking people you know, people who are complaining about the parking, um, were basically, there's not enough parking and there's going to be too many cars spilling out and parking throughout the neighborhood. Okay, understood. And that was actually something that we really worked hard and we really tried to provide um, to ease the suffering of the parking situation, including, um, at a great expense, adding additional, um, you know, parking stackers into the parking structure, and even on our own dime, going above and beyond, um, offering to pay for on-street slanted parking stalls to increase our parking count that, you know, we weren't required to. You know, we were already 40% above what we were required to on the parking count because we wanted to. The city actually wanted us to have a lot less. So, what do you do? When people still fight against you and you're trying so hard to help alleviate their concerns, but they do not want to hear your answer, they just want you to surrender. They just want you to back down and not do your project. Now, here's where I think it has relevance to the rest of life. I think it has relevance to the rest of life in the fact that there are many times in your life when you're going to face uh, people or entities that they just want you to surrender. They don't want to cooperate with you. They don't want to compromise with you. They don't want to give in to any one of the things that you're trying to do, any of the things that are important to you. They just want you to sit down and shut up. And what do you do with people like that? Especially if you're a Christian. You're taught the importance of repentance and forgiveness. 
Um, part of what that interprets as is a lot of times we interpret that as meaning that we need to apologize to people. The danger with that, the danger with apologizing to people that are not willing to forgive you or compromise with you is that they will just keep taking and taking and taking and they will never actually allow you to exist. They don't want you to exist because you are their enemy. Take, for example, the cancel culture. This has been talked about a lot, ad nauseum, uh, amongst a lot of conservative and um, traditional liberals, and I say that traditional liberals as in libertarian-minded people, who, or classical liberals, I should say, um, who they believe in freedom, individual liberty, and they're also very disturbed by the cancel culture. So the cancel culture, in a nutshell, what happens? Well, somebody, you know, somebody gets, uh, you know, accused, you know, like an old tweet gets pulled up, you know, from like 10 years ago. Oh, you know, like, uh, like, for example, Kevin Hart, you know, back when he was uh, given that, uh, you know, he was given a hell of a time because he had brought up, you know, he had had some jokes that were kind of uh, a little bit homophobic, you know, not very. I mean, they they were reasonable jokes. I, I actually thought they were reasonable jokes. They wouldn't be the kind of jokes that I would tell, but they were jokes that he thought were funny at the time, and this was 10 years before um, the, the DOMA decision in the Supreme Court. So, I mean, this was like in t 2005 when the majority of the public was still against homosexual marriage and um, there was gen still generally a vibe that homosexuality was a sin by the general populace. And so here he was for, for comments that he had made 10 years prior or 12 years prior for that matter. And he's being canceled for the, you know, for doing the Oscars, you know, like as the, uh, as the MC and this was something that he doesn't even believe anymore. He had, um, he had evolved his thinking on things. And yet, they were coming after him like crazy. He tried to apologize. Well, guess what? That only made things worse. They tried to cancel him even more. You notice the only people who don't get canceled are the ones who never apologize. Now, granted, it drives the left nuts because they want to control you. They want to destroy you and control you. Well, no thanks. I, I'd prefer to stay. I, I'd prefer. I, I'd prefer to stay free. Personally, I have absolutely no desire to be enslaved to a bunch of communists. So, apologies are not always the right thing. Let's let's just be clear about that. Apologies are sometimes a really bad idea. And so I think it's really important to make that clear. Sometimes in in most in most of life you need to apologize, right? In most of life you're with normal people who have normal behavior and they're willing to forgive they're willing to discuss things with you yes with people like that feel free to apologize feel free to make amends don't over apologize be honest about your apologies um, if you truly are honestly ashamed of what you did yeah sure apologize even in public to the cancel culture if you really do sincerely feel that way but do it with boldness and in other words, don't go, don't go out like some of these people do and apologize like, um, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I was insensitive. You just say, look, that was then. And yeah, would I say that now? No. But that was then. 
okay? It's over, okay? I'm not gonna apologize for something that I don't even believe in anymore. I can say, yeah, I'm not gonna do it anymore like that. That's not who I am now. That was who I was then, but I have changed because I am capable of changing and improving. Do we actually do that kind of stuff? Do we actually um, fight back? Too often we don't, and we need to fight back. The, the people who are trying to destroy us, these Antifa types, Brown Berets, uh, BLM, the, the cancel culture uh, people, they're authoritarian fascists. They're trying to destroy us all by taking us down one by one and calling us racist, pig, capitalist pigs. They're trying to call us gentrifiers. In my case, like they were actually calling me out by name and breathing out threatenings in the freaking public meeting. This was a public meeting. Okay. <laughs> it's, I mean like this, this was like, wow. Um, you're making threats to me during a public meeting. Now, f granted, it was a it was a Zoom meeting. I mean, because that's how all the city meetings are right now, um, because of COVID, you know. But you know, it was like it was so stupid. It was really, really stupid. Because, I mean, we could easily just call the cops on them and say, hey, they're threatening our lives. Now, we, we didn't. Um, I don't think there is ever going to come anything of it. I think they were just making hollow threats. Now, if they ever start making real threats, like to my person, maybe I'll take it more seriously. But um, it's really disturbing that there's people out there that feel like it's perfectly appropriate to make ad hominem attacks and threats because they disagree with you politically. They disagree with what you're doing professionally even. How can you coexist with people like that? How can you unite with people who are behaving that way? You can't. And so... I will happily unite with people who are willing to be decent human beings instead of animals. And I, I don't like calling people animals, but if you're going to act as though civilized rules of order do not matter, if you're going to try to threaten personal violence, then you are no longer human because violence is not the human way. Violence is the animal way. That's what animals do. Animals fight each other physically. We humans, we many times drop down into the animal level and get into fights physically. We shouldn't, but too many, too many times we do. And this is something that we really need to stop. It's the 21, it's the 21st century, man. Come on. We really need to get our acts together. We need to behave like humans and talk about our issues and alleviate our problems through the political process and through discussion and open, honest debate. Open and honest debate means we can actually talk openly, openly and honestly without the fear of our professional lives being destroyed through cancel culture. So, hopefully you enjoyed this little discussion. I'm going to get some breakfast and get on to the office. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'm the Colorblind Architect. Peace out.